realize what a powerful force is gathered here tonight between these four walls, show me a greater power on the whole continent of Africa. Show me a greater power anywhere. And then, in 1986, we sent out a document to all divisions of the Afrikanerbon stating that it was inevitable that there was going to be a black state president. The National Party had nothing to do with this. It was a secret internal Afrikanerbon project with only a few people at the time being addressed. To understand the history of South Africa, one must understand the history of the Afrikaner Bruderbond, today known as the Afrikanerbond or the AB. It is very important to understand that when we refer to the Afrikanerbond, we mean to include all of its affiliates. That is important because like in its past, the Afrikanerbond operates in secret. The Afrikanerbond might now have a website and proclaims to be open, but its true dealings, intentions and affiliations remain undisclosed. We say undisclosed because its intentions affiliations and dealings are no longer secret despite their best efforts. It is convenient for the Afrikaner Bond, like other secret organizations, to be able to distance itself from any of its affiliates or organizations that become unpopular. For example, the National Party now has way too many responsibilities through the decisions it made in the past. They could close the National Party and distance themselves from this old unpopular organization and create a new innocent political party. This way, the true management remains in power and bears no responsibility for the old discarded organization. It is critical for us not to be fooled by this tactic. New directions for the Dutch Reformed Church, which this past week has made a landmark decision, which has now meant that same-sex marriages will now be recognized by the church. Now, with a 64% majority, the church voted in favor of acknowledging same-sex unions and allowing gay ministers to be ordained without the need for them to be celibate. It is important to understand that the decision to accept homosexuality by the Dutch Reformed Church was first discussed and accepted in an Afrikanerbond Bondsraad meeting before it was accepted at Synod level. Just as the US Supreme Court's decision to undemocratically legalize gay marriage in the United States was first planned, discussed 
and accepted by the various secret societies that control the United States. The Afrikaner Bond was founded in 1918 with the name Young South Africa. Its name was changed to Bruderbond in 1920. The organization was founded in reaction to economical strife and exclusion the Boer or White Afrikaner experienced after the Second Boer War. The British scorched earth tactic and the use of concentration camps under Kitchener cost the lives of 27,000 Boer women and children and devastated the livelihood of the rest. The Afrikaner Bruderbond became a very powerful organization with every South African president from 1948 to 1994 being a member of the Bruderbond. In its early years, the Bruderbond was geared and dedicated to resisting the influences from the outside world. The Republic is the only sure and stable friend that the Western nations have in Africa. We are here to stay and we are here to aid all others in whatever they may need and can get from us. We have for a very long time developed in South Africa a nation of our own, angry, prosperous, aggressive. We hope that the rest of Africa will become like that. The record of stable government will continue in South Africa. Surely it must be a record. Six prime ministers and only five changes of government in 50 years. However, in the future, we will seek the same form of stability in the government, in the Republic, which should ensure stability too in the economic life of the country. Not for us, the sudden constitutional upheavals which create dictatorships in certain parts of Africa, chaos in the Congo, and forms of multiracial government elsewhere which only create the desire for domination by one over the other, without any economic certainty development. We see gradual development of each of our groups under the conservative rule of Hendrik Verwoerd, who was also a Bruderbonder, South Africa flourished. You paid one rand for two US dollars or one rand for two British pounds. Crime was almost non-existent. As a result of hostile reaction engendered against our organization, the Afrikaner Bund, particularly by the Freemasons within the ranks of the National Party. We cooperated with Dr. Verwurt in allowing the establishment of a judicial investigation into activities of secret organizations. In the book The Super Afrikaners, published in 1978, it shows Bruderbond documents regularly mention the struggle against international secret organizations like the Freemasons and the Sons of England. Then, on 6 September 1966, on the corpse of a fellow nation. We shall become nobody's corpse. We shall fight for our existence and we shall survive.
under sinister circumstances that mirrored the assassination of John F. Kennedy, Hendrik Verwoerd was assassinated, most likely by the Freemasons. That would explain the strange modern insignia of the Afrikaner Bond and its affiliates. As verlichte Afrikaner Dr. Gerrit Viljoen and one of the National Party's top brains, he is at the forefront of the planning for change, and as chief of the Brüderbund, he holds the most important position in the cell system that is being geared to prepare conservative Afrikaners for change. Now the Afrikaner Bruderbond moved further to the left of the middle of white politics. The Afrikaner Bond actually started getting their doubts about apartheid in the late 1970s. They wouldn't have elected me as chairman if they were still full-blooded apartheid supporters. We started looking at the constitutional future of South Africa and where the Afrikaner would fit in. We made the firm decision that we stand on the side of a negotiated solution and not of war. It may sound simplistic now, but at the time it was quite overwhelming. I remember an Eitfurnerat meeting during 1983 where there was a difference of opinion. I asked every member to stand up and declare his position. In the end, there were two out of 18 that could have been termed as right. The others were prepared to run with this risky undertaking. And then, in 1986, we sent out a document to all divisions of the Afrikaner Bund, stating that it was inevitable that there was going to be a black state president. Interview with Peter de Lange, former chairman of the Afrikaner Bund, by Max de Preer, 2012. The Afrikaner Bond document, the basis is that can be for the voortbestaan van the Afrikaner, was approved by the Afrikaner Bond's Executive Council in November 1986, with an 89% of the Afrikaner Bond branches agreeing with it. David Welsh, The Rise and Fall of Apartheid, page 202. Clearly, by November 1986, the Afrikaner Bond had already decided for the rest of South Africa. Every other vote, political debate, referendum or speech was all masquerades. South Africa's fate was sealed. On the inside of a Bondsraad meeting, it was decided that South Africa was to become just another failed African state on the way to a revolution. For this, its top members would be greatly rewarded. In 1986, the majority of Afrikaners were still opposed to transformation. So, the Afrikaner Bond would have to somehow sell this new multicultural liberal agenda. The Eitfurnerat members had the task to visit the visions and regions to put the document in the correct context. I probably did more than most myself. The Afrikaner Bond had about 18,000 members then. 
It meant that the Afrikaner Bond had to go through the country, cities and the platteland to convince people in some position of leadership in their communities that a negotiated solution was the way forward, that a full democracy with voting rights for all was the answer. Those people then went to talk to those in their spheres of influence and so on. Everybody down the line knew other Afrikaners to talk to. It had a tremendous impact on the Afrikaner and broader South African community at the time. The National Party had nothing to do with this. It was a secret internal Afrikaner bond project with only a few people at the time being addressed. Interview with Peter de Lange, former chairman of the Afrikaner bond by Max de Prie, 2012. Peter de Lange was also the first prominent Afrikaner to secretly negotiate with the ANC. It wasn't a chance meeting. I knew the Ford Foundation and the ANC were planning it, and I was happy to meet. I told the Executive Council of the Afrikaner Bond that there would be an ANC presence at the conference. The Afrikaner Bond was paying for my trip. Interview with Peter de Lange, former chairman of the Afrikaner Bond by Max de Prie 2012. According to de Lange, the acceptance of this document caused an exodus of about a third of the Afrikaner Bond members. This exodus completed the liberal transformation of the Afrikaner Bond that started with the death of Dr. Verwoerd. These leaving members mostly align themselves with South Africa's right wing. Eén ding moet die wereld daar buitenkant weet. Ons kan nie sonder vryheid lewe en as dit dan moet, dan sal ons ompad met die geweld van het werk. Ons is nie bereid om in een verkiesing in te gaan waar die ANC die boere sy kop in tel. Most of these leaving Afrikaner Bond members who found the Afrikaner Bond's document on transformation unacceptable align themselves with the South Africa's right wing. But, because of international liberalism and Europe's recent past, these organizations were very unpopular internationally. And, with the aid of the Afrikaner Bond's Naspers media giant, these organizations were made unpopular in South Africa. It held up a mirror to a more modern-minded nationalist of what the National Party had stood for in the not-so-distant past, and they did not like what they saw. The crude racism of the HNP, the AWB, and other groups in the mushrooming ultra-right embarrassed and repelled them, thereby lending urgency to the quest for a more equitable system. But, unlike today, during the 90s, the right wing really was dangerous. They were armed, organized and passionate. They also weren't being controlled by the spirit of guilt that prevails today. Even if you still believe that they were bad, you cannot deny they were right concerning the future of South Africa. But the crude racism was a political media construct that seemed to play into the hands of the Afrikaner Bond's plans for transformation. It may sound strange or even ironic, but I am convinced that the founding of the Conservative Party 
also contributed to my leap of 2nd February 1990. In 1993, former Freedom Front leader General Constant Filiun mobilized between 50,000 and 60,000 armed Afrikaners in preparation for war with the ANC's armed wing in Kontwe Wisizwe. We had computers in all centers with the details of all the men we knew we could rely on. Filiun reveals just how close SA came to war, independent online, retrieved 2009-04-29. A more moderate advocate of Afrikaner separatism was Constant Villun. He and Terra Blanche both belonged to an alliance of more than 20 right-wing movements, the Afrikaner Fox Front. Villun was a former chief of the South African Defence Force and a war hero, the experienced general. He was reluctant, though claiming he could call on 14,000 army reservists. I also had the forces available, I would say, from what would split off from the Defence Force. Because had I really taken a military action, there was a real danger of polarization within the Defence Force. It would certainly have been a substantial number of people that would have uh, splitted from, from the Defence Force and would have joined me in, uh, in fighting for the liberation of the African people. When joining the Bruderbond, recruits took an oath of secrecy and even today, many are unwilling to discuss their membership. Yes, I was a member, he says. The Afrikaner Bruderbond was a better think tank than the National Party had been. The day I joined, I said, look, I'm here to serve my people. I don't want any perks just because I'm now a member of the Afrikaner Bruderbond. I was adamant that I didn't want to benefit from being a member. That story that the Bruderbond manipulated situations to have its members appointed to key positions is true. As a Bruderbonder, Constant was, as they say in the Mafia, a made man. Members were carefully vetted before they were asked to join, and once they did, their careers and opportunities generally flourished and increased. These were the men who could make or break the careers and lives of others, men to be feared endowed with the trust of his government ministers, most of whom were fellow Bruderbonders, the general undertook several clandestine missions of a political and military nature. Random House Strike, Dennis Kreiwagen, Brothers in War and Peace, 1 August 2014. After Constant abandoned his men, they were left leaderless, confused, demoralized, harmless. Now there was no resistance to reform. Even the independent black state of Boputatswana was to be completely assimilated. Now you, you held me responsible. At least the AWB tried to help and what is more interesting is at least on record there it stands now that we were willingly to die for black people for an independent black state of Putatswana. How can I feel myself responsible? was able to see Ruth Mayer for the first time dancing uh, on the floor uh, where we were having this party. He was quite happy, he was quite uh, jovial and I kept wondering whether I would have been as happy as he was if I was in his position having finally given in in the way that they had. For the good of South Africa, I want to expose the African National Congress, the Communist Party and the South African government for what they are. For much too long, ever since the beginning of the negotiations, we have had 
secret deals between the Nationalist Party government and the Communist Party, the African National Congress. Mangopo was very arrogant when they wanted to tell him that he should resign and that if he does not resign, he would then be ordered to resign. And then he was very arrogant and they told him that now, from now on, you are no longer president of Botswana. You know, Mr. Pigbotter came accompanied by Mr. Maharaj, who apparently came to ensure that Mr. Botter carried out his instructions, Mr. Maharaj's instructions. When de Klerk made his speech on the 2nd February 1990, he thought that by unburning the ANC, he would be able to control political events in our country. I don't believe that he knew that he was actually unleashing a force which he would find far, far, far beyond his own political imagination and control. Nasbash, originally Nationale Pash, was founded by Yebiem Herzog in 1915, the same man that founded the National Party. Nasbash is the largest company in Africa and the seventh largest internet company in the world, with operations in 133 countries. When Chris Becker first got involved with MultiChoice in the mid-1980s, Nasbash was a rather grey company run by executives who wore grey shoes and hung out with the National Party. When he stepped down as CEO earlier this year, he had turned it into a multimedia behemoth, operating in more than 130 countries and made himself into a dollar billionaire in the process. At the heart of his strategy, a desire and an ability to operate in countries that do not speak English and a stunning investment in a Chinese internet company called Tencent. Tencent, yes, that Tencent, the one that owns Riot Games and has a significant share in Epic and Activision Blizzard, and also the ascendant Chinese competitor to Amazon, Alibaba, hence the name Sesame. So the owners of China's largest social networks have partnered with the government to create something akin to the US credit score. But instead of measuring how regularly you pay your bills, it measures how obediently you follow the party line. They dredge data from your social network, so if you post pictures of Tiananmen Square or share a link about the recent stock market collapse, your Sesame credit score goes down. Share a link from the state-sponsored news agency about how good the economy's doing, and your score goes up. But Alibaba and Tencent are also the largest online retailers in China, so Sesame Credit is also able to pull data from your purchases. If you're making purchases the state deems valuable, like work shoes or local agricultural products, your score goes up. If you import anime from Japan, though, down the score goes. And this score has real-world consequences. Like many games, Sesame Credit has tiers and levels, and having a high score gives you special benefits, like making it easier to get the paperwork you need to travel, or making it easier to get a loan. Chris Becker, Naspash's most prominent former CEO, who, as of 2015, was on a sabbatical to search for opportunities for Naspash, owns a 200 hectare farm in Stellenbosch. I challenge the viewer to venture a guess on the farm's name. In the process. At the heart of his strategy, a desire and an ability to operate in countries that do not speak English. Naspash is the Afrikaner Bonds media guard that ensures that only the Afrikaner Bonds agenda is promoted among the South African public. It is easy to tell 
Which organizations are affiliated with the Afrikaner Bund and the broader New World Order establishment by looking at who NASPERS promotes or belittles? NASPERS refuses to even publish a paid ad from Afrikaner organizations that are not affiliated with the Afrikaner Bund or that promote Afrikaner independence. But for the Democratic Alliance, NASPAS gladly publishes adverts that promote multiracial homosexuality among children. Because of the overwhelmingly negative comments received by NASPAS's preferred columnists, Media24 had to close its comment section and now only allows the very positive comments. It is also through Naspas's media that the Afrikaner Bond could mislead the Afrikaner enough to receive an overwhelming yes vote in the 1992 referendum. Through the large Afrikaner Bond network of companies like Sunlum, Pashkor and Momentum, Naspas is connected to the South African tobacco and industrial conglomerate, the Rembrandt Group. The Rembrandt Group, that is today split into Remgro and Richmond, was founded by well-known broederbonder Anton Rupert. Anton Rupert had a very good relationship with Nelson Mandela. The Rupert family is one of the richest families in South Africa, with an estimated worth of $7.7 .7 billion. Rob's always spoken about it. But we sold the Cabernet and the, uh, the, front, the, front. the Cabernet Franc, I think, is probably the best buyer of Chelsea Wine Ball. And now we're tasting the Rupert & Rothschild. It's the Classique Bottling, their Rouge 2010. This is from the Western Cape of South Africa. And I'm very excited about South African wines as of late. The wines have been super impressive, really over delivering. Five years ago, I wouldn't have looked twice at South African wines. They were very, they were okay, but very average. In the last five or six years, it, they've really done a 180, and the wines are, are super impressive and really over deliver for the price and this is a great example. This is a partnership between uh, a great long-standing estate in South Africa and then the Rothschild family from Bordeaux. So what they're doing here is it's almost... All right, hello wine drinking people, we're back. Whew. A lot of drinking going on here at the Wine Watch. And next up, um, well you know what I feel about South African wines. You know a lot of junk out there but recently we've had some very good stuff and uh, you know anything with the Rothschild name on it is going to be outstanding. And this is Edmund de Rothschild. He's one of the largest shareholders in Lafitte Rothschild, but the Rothschild family, big banking family, big, big money. And, uh, you know, it's that little gesture. And, uh, hey, let's go down to the Cape, the Western Cape, and try to make some good wines down in South Africa. Well, you know, they do have a beautiful terroir in South Africa and a beautiful country. The people very nice, so, you know, all the right conditions to make fine wine, why not? Then these Rupert and Rothschild wines, a joint venture here with the Rothschild family, and uh, some wonderful stuff. I would have to say some of the better and better priced things that I've had in, from South Africa all year. The Chardonnay, some lovely toasty oak. The case was put in a more sophisticated form by the left-leaning liberal J.A. Hobson, author of the classic Imperialism, A Study, 1902. Like many radical writers of the period, Hobson regarded the Boer War as having been engineered by a small group of international financiers, chiefly German in origin and Jewish in race. The Rothschilds, in his view, were central to this group. Does anyone seriously suppose, he asked in imperialism, that a great war could be undertaken by any European state or any great state loan subscribed? 
If the House of Rothschild and its connections set their face against it, Cherub had made much the same point from a German nationalist perspective in his history. The House of Rothschild has arisen from the quarrels between states, has become great and mighty from wars, and the misfortune of states and peoples has been its fortune. Only the Rothschilds, however, have a mythology. The world's bankers. The Rothschilds are the wonders of modern banking. We see the descendants of Judah, after a persecution of 2,000 years, peering above kings, rising higher than emperors, and holding a whole continent in the hollow of their hands. The Rothschilds govern a Christian world. Not a cabinet moves without their advice. They stretch their hand with equal ease from Petersburg to Vienna, from Vienna to Paris, from Paris to London, from London to Washington. Baron Rothschild, the head of the house, is the true king of Judah, the prince of the captivity, the Messiah so long looked for by this extraordinary people. He holds the keys of peace or war, blessing or cursing. They are the brokers and counselors of the kings of Europe and of the Republican chiefs of America. What more can they desire? Niles Weekly Register, 1835 to 36. The transformation that started with the death of Dr. Verwoerd is complete. The Afrikaner Bond had turned from guardian to handler. The Afrikaner Bond is today the New World Order's local management team. It serves as watchdog and controls every aspect of Afrikaner life and aspires to enslave and control the black nations of South Africa. It controls the Afrikaner through its influence in culture, finance, education, religion, media, labor, and politics. The Afrikaner Bund ensures that all Afrikaners conform to the international agenda of multiculturalism and multiracialism. Political correctness, feminism, sexual promiscuity and homosexuality, financial dependency through debt, multi religions and occultism, blind obedience. internationalism instead of nationalism destruction of the family slavery through socialism has become so common that a woman in South Africa is more likely to be raped than to learn to read.
please donate to the production of these upcoming documentaries.